The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them. And they have received them and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. And now I'm no longer in the world but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be as one as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Will you bow your heads with me in prayer, please? Gracious Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have created and allowed us to share in. This morning, Lord, would you take our minds and think through them? Take my lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your son, Jesus. Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ, holy name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. It's good to see you all. Um, just aside for some of you 8 o'clockers who weren't there this morning because you came because of the meeting, uh, funny thing, you know how I always like to tell you when I make mistakes in the bulletin, uh, this morning we said, Alleluia, Chris is risen. I don't know where the T went, and I don't know who Chris is, but if you know a Chris who rose from the dead, apparently we celebrated that at the 8 o'clock, so uh, just thought you'd enjoy a little humor, get you warmed up for the sermon Um, When I was in seminary, I uh, had an introduction to theology classes, uh, systematic theology class, with uh, Dr. Andrew Purvis, who was a professor of systematic theology. Um, He's a brilliant guy, uh, lots of humor, deep thinker. He's also Scottish, so you know how they put English-speaking people on the commercials late at night, because we know, like, Americans love accents, right? So it it was helpful when this guy's got this Scottish accent, because you think, he must be smarter, Right? Um, which he was. He was brilliant. Um, one of my favorite professors, and actually he was at one of my ordinations. But uh, I, re- I remember asking him a question. I don't remember uh, if I was serious or joking, probably somewhere in between. Uh, we were talking about the Ascension, which, uh, if you remember, the Ascension occurred 40 days after the resurrection. That's important. Everybody remembers 40. It's an important biblical number. So 40 days after Easter Sunday is... Last Thursday, did you, did you remember to celebrate Ascension Day, right? It's just like, whoosh, whoa, there was another holiday. We talk about it in the scriptures, we talk about it in the prayer. We often forget about Ascension Day. So we read about it on Sunday like we did today. But he was talking about Ascension, and something struck me, ironically, quizzically, I don't know. Jesus says, I'm going to the Father. Now we have a trinity, everybody remembers that, right? So if Jesus is going to the Father, and then I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is with the Father, and the Holy Spirit hasn't come. So I said, Dr. Purvis, if Jesus is with the Father, and the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet, who's watching over us? Where's God? Because apparently God's all up in heaven. He's not here. I don't think he liked the question. Uh, I enjoyed poking the bear, but... um, But it was an interesting kind of after conversation. Because, of course, as you all know, I hope that God, of course, was still present. When Jesus went and as they waited for the Holy Spirit, it wasn't like God had disappeared. God is always present. 
It's just a matter of manifestation, of experience, of connection. I'm going to use a bad metaphor because it's not a fun one, but think about nuclear weapons or actually nuclear power. We didn't create the power inherent in the atom. We just helped coax it forth. We kind of helped manifest it. That's kind of what happened between Ascension and Pentecost. God was still here, but the Holy Spirit coming into that room on Pentecost is the manifestation, the coaxing forth, the interconnectedness now of God and his people. So that's kind of what happened. But what I want to look at today is this idea of Ascension to Pentecost because it's important that we remember that Jesus ascended and that that opened a door for Pentecost. So the question today is, why? Why does ascension matter to Pentecost, number one? And two, what does it mean for you? You're like, okay, Jesus ascended, and then the Holy Spirit came. I don't know. But what does it mean for you? What does it mean for me? What did it mean for those disciples? Especially in relation, if you were here last week, to our talk about evangelism, proclaiming, witnessing. What does that mean? So today in Acts, we see Jesus and his disciples, it's his last thing, it's his goodbye. And they're on the Mount of Olives on the kind of far side towards Bethany, if any of you have been there. And uh, so he says his last words, according to Luke and Acts. And uh, interestingly enough, the disciples, it's like they wanted to poke the bear with the question, the silly question one more time. All right, so you're going, you're leaving us. What about this kingdom? When is your kingdom coming to save Israel? Basically, they're still asking, aren't you going to ride in on your little horse with your army of angels and destroy the Romans like, you, like we thought you were going to do? And you notice, did you, did you hear the message? You can look at it in your scripture. Jesus is like, we're not going to talk about that. He kind of brushes the question aside. And then he does something interesting. He begins by telling them, it's not for you To know the time and places, that's God's work. So what's he saying? He's saying two important things. One, don't worry about it. The kids these days say, nanya, right? Some of you know that. Nanya, it's none of your business. Don't worry about that. God's got that. So in essence, he's saying, trust that God has all of it in plan. It's also a little reminder for those of us who have either been in it, thought about it, or looking forward to it. The idea of prophesying the end of the world and the apocalypse in multiple, multiple places out of the mouth of Jesus says, don't do that. You can see the signs, but don't try and figure out the day and how it's going to happen. None ya. None ya business. Your work is to trust in God that he will do what God needs to do because God's will will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. So he starts with trust. Then he says, guess what? In a few days, or, well, he doesn't say time. He says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit in power to be with you. So what is that? Well, we just talked about it. When the Holy Spirit comes, like the nuclear power being coaxed out, that is the manifestation of God present in our hearts. So it is a connection. It's the reality of God coming into our being, which means we now intimately know God. Jesus said it multiple times this Easter season. He says it today, that we would be one with him. That's how Holy Spirit does it. So by definition, what he's saying is you will now fully know God because God will be living within your heart. Which is interesting because they asked about a kingdom. He brushes it aside, but he doesn't say there won't be a kingdom. He just kind of alludes to how the kingdom's going to come differently. I just love doing the horse. Can I do the horse again? So he's not going to come in on the horse. Sorry, I can't help it. Monty Python. He comes in a wind and a fire. Does he come with guns and military and government and politics? No. Where does he come? Into your heart, in love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. It's a whole different kingdom. So trust God. He's got it in hand. Know God by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now he gets to the work. You notice? There are steps first. Then he says, you will go and be witnesses in Jerusalem. Step one, Judea. Step two, Samaria. Step three, to the ends of the world. Even to this little hamlet, this little bubble in Old Sable. But you see how it worked. Trusting and knowing God comes before being a witness. That's important. We all know what a witness is. 
Some of you have been in court on juries, of course, not, not uh, you know, you didn't do anything wrong. Most of you have seen TV shows or movies. You know what a witness is, the definition. What does a witness do? The witness, we hope, tells the truth of what they have seen and heard. So Jesus says, you're going to do that. You're going to be my witnesses. You're going to be my hearers and my seers, and you're going to go out and you're going to pro proclaim what you have seen and heard in me. But notice again what happened first. Trust in God, knowing God, empowered by God, now you can go do your work. Now you can move out. So this is where we begin to see how ascension opens the door for Pentecost. Some of you are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, you didn't say anything. Okay, let's get to it. How does ascension open the door for that then? Three things. First, Jesus ascends, and it must have been pretty cool. Some of the movies with the spaceships, with the clouds, that's Old Testament clouds. Jesus apparently left them in a cloud, in his body. He didn't turn into a spirit or a ghost. He wasn't Casper. Bodily, just, I don't know, like he walked up a cloud or a cloud picked him up. I don't know, but he went up. Was it real? Was it a spirit? I don't know, but he went up. Why is that important? Because that shows you that he is who? Is he a first century Jewish rabbi peasant just saying some nice things and telling you to love your neighbor? Partially. He is the risen ascended Lord God. He's going to heaven to be with his Father, who we heard today he is one with, which makes Jesus who? Say it with me, God. That's important. The second thing is once he's gone and they're like, oh, <laughs> right? Like, can you imagine just for a second? Jesus, a man who's been with us, who's the Messiah who just died and rose again, is now on a cloud going to heaven. Do you smell that? Do you feel it's, it must have been insane. And they're staring up. They're like, wait, what's going on? And the angels, well, it says two men in white. But do you notice this theme in Luke? Do you notice the angels were at his birth, at his resurrection, and his ascension? Do you know who angels attend to? You can say it again. God. And they're like, hey, you, stop, stop. Look down here. Eyes. Eyes here. He's going to come back. You have work to do. This is important as well. Not only do you now know that Jesus is the arisen and ascended Lord God, you also have been given the promise and the hope that he's going to return. Why is that important to you and I? Because he didn't just give us his Holy Spirit and say, go have fun, go play until you die, go play in the woods, here's the scripture, just run around willy-nilly. He says there will be an end in time when I will return. That's important. This doesn't go on forever. It also inculcates the purpose of which we were created for. It returns us back to what we were intended to do in the garden, to steward his creation, to work with God for the proclamation and the glory of his being. I'm using a lot of theological terminology today. What does that mean? Well, when the angels said, Stop looking up there. He's coming back. It gives them hope and purpose for the future and a direction to go because they know he's going to come back. And so they must do his work and prepare for it. The last thing that Ascension does to open up for Pentecost actually kind of creaks the door open. Think about this. How many Jesuses were there on earth? The, the real Jesus, not all the Jesuses or the other Joshuas or the Yah, whatever. There was one. How many people can Jesus literally talk to in three years, personally? Right? Some of you. How many friends do you have? Five? Twenty? Facebook. Maybe you have 300 or 500, right? I mean, on the internet, you can still get to a lot of people, but you can't get to all of them, can you? There are places where there, you won't go. There are people you won't talk to. There are places the internet doesn't exist. So how does God solve the problem of having one person proclaiming the message in personal blood and body? Well, first, Jesus has to ascend so that the Spirit can come. The bodily Jesus was one person. When the Holy Spirit comes, now how many people is God working through? You, 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 you. All of you out there in the Internet. 
He is now present in all believers, which means he has now multiplied by a factor of a thousand the bodily people walking around proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. Not just one Jesus, he has, if we actually believe the people who do this numbering, how many Jesuses does he have, basically? Two billion Jesuses, theoretically. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, you're a Christian, therefore you are a little Christ, you are a Christ-like one. And so he now has two billion Christians all over the world, and what are they doing? Or what should we be doing? We talked about it last week. You should be a witness and a proclaimer of the message that you have seen and heard in Christ. And this is where ascension comes. Jesus had to ascend first so we would know he was God. The angels remind us that he's going to come back, which gives us a purpose and a hope for the future, and it gives us work to do. That work of proclaiming the message, which we are enabled to do by what, he says? By the presence of the Holy Spirit giving us the power and the truth to know the message, the courage to go out in the world and proclaim the message, and the wisdom to do it. So he's empowered us. And why are we empowered by the Holy Spirit? Because Jesus ascended and the Holy Spirit came down. You see that? It's full circle. Ascension opens the door to Pentecost, which is based on the opening of Pente uh, Ascension. You can only have Pentecost because there was Ascension. And some of you who were ever wondering what Ascension's purpose is, I just told you. Now we can leave, right? Meeting time, right? The Ascension is important because it sets you to know who Jesus is so that you can become trustworthy in him so that you can come to know him as God so that you can then receive the Holy Spirit and be empowered to be a witness for his gospel. And after all of that, now all of that didn't happen right away, but we'll consider that the, the system of what is happening. They go back to Jerusalem to the upper room. We're not sure if it's the same upper room where they had the Last Supper. And what do they do? Did you hear it today? Did you read it? Do you remember it? They got together and what did they do? Did they have a party? Did they cry? Did they have a Q&A session? Did they get on their cell phones and their internet and play Tetris or something? They prayed. They prayed. More than likely, they prayed for 10 days until the wind and the fire came. See, as I talked about evangelism last week, I didn't really blow up the story to the purpose of what is come and which we are called to. Because though, yes, Taking scripture and the words of scripture out in the world and giving it to people is part of it. What Jesus shows us today, what he calls us to remember, is that first you must trust and know the Lord by your faith in the presence and baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear that again. By your faith in Jesus and your baptism, your heart is opened for the actual presence of the living God by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you believe that this happened and you have been through baptism and you are a faithful follower of Jesus, the Spirit of God, the living God, is inside of you. I will bet my entire life on it, literally. And by that power, you are called... The power is not, and I always do this. Those of you who remember the Lord of the Rings, Gollum, I do this about two times a year. Oh, my precious. The Holy Spirit within you, the faith you have, the cross and resurrection, isn't so you can sit around and go, I'm spiritual but not religious. It's not so you can sit around and go, I'm so glad I'm saved. It's not so you can go around and go, Jesus is such a nice person. He tells you why he gives you his Holy Spirit to empower you to tell other people why he gave you the Holy Spirit. That's the purpose of ascension into Pentecost. And as we enter this week preparing for Pentecost, and I have to personally say the excited celebration of baptizing my son Benjamin, please join us next week at 9 o'clock, no 8 or 10. Maybe some of us will be in that space where I was in seminary, wondering, where, where's God? Did he go somewhere? Maybe we'll be like those disciples caught Staring, going, where'd he go? I don't, I don't know. Is he in my life? Is he in my heart? I'm here to remind you, Jesus is here to tell you that by your faith and baptism in him, you have the Holy Spirit. You have been empowered to proclaim the message. I'm going to say something very difficult for every one of you in here, including myself. There are no excuses. I can't do that. 
That person doesn't want to hear it. I can't proclaim the message. Yes, you can. Do you know why? Because you're not doing the work. Where does the power come to do that? It's not from you. If it was based on our ability to do it, God wouldn't have to die on a cross. So he gave us his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was opened to the door because Jesus ascended so that we would have the power to proclaim the message, the courage to do it. The power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit given to proclaim that message. To stop staring and wondering where he is, the angel said, and get to the work of proclaiming him so that we are ready whenever he returns. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.